All right, everybody, that is your famous British marching tune opening into the particular <laughs> that was used for this movie. You're listening to the Radlich and Broadcasting Network's summer blockbuster review series. I'm your host and have been for all of these things, as far as I can remember. Robert Winfrey, thank you all for joining us. A little bit of trivia for all of you out there. That particular marching tune that was co-opted by, uh, I believe, Comet as their jingle for their bathroom cleaning products, first appeared on screen in a movie featuring Sir Alec Guinness. I believe he won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor that year. Might have just been nominated. Uh, The film is The Bridge on the River Kwai. And that's the first time that was heard kind of widespread unless you were in the army and used it as your marching tune. Don't ask me why I know that. I could tell you why, but it's a lo- it's a very short and very boring story, so I won't get into it. But we're here reviewing The Expendables 3, the latest uh, box office release. I'll say release, I won't say blockbuster. And here with me to help break down this uh, action glut is, as always, the spiritual patriarch, and in some cases literal patriarch of the Radlich and Broadcasting Network, Mark Radlich, all the way from uh, Florida, where... You don't want to leave your house for fear of running into Florida, man. How you doing, Mark? Comet. It makes your mouth turn green. Comet. It yep. tastes like gasoline. Comet. It makes you vomit. So eat some Comet and vomit today. These uh, thoughts and expressions are those of the uh, not those of the Rattles and Broadcasting Network. We do not suggest that you eat Comet. No, it it would probably end badly. And again, like I said, British Army marching jingle, Bridge on the River Kwai, Sir Alec Guinness. I think it won Best Picture that year. The the volume of useless things I know, everybody, staggering. Did you know that you were going to review all those movies in 2015 uh, that you don't want to review? <laughs> I'm, I'm I very much doubt that some of those movies you and I discussed that are coming out in 2015, I will actually see. You're going to be reviewing them all. We'll see. Well, I can, I can, I can phone it in. Pretty easy, as far as some of those goes. It stinks. <laughs> you Mark, your thoughts. Uh. So, uh, we had the Expendables three come out. The la- kind of the last hurrah for the summer's movie season, as far as like the action movies and the big blockbusters go. We're getting towards. Either the more serious stuff that wants to be an Oscar contender or the stuff that is just not of a high enough quality to compete with all of the big summer blockbusters. So this is kind of our last hurrah until November when we'll be reviewing The Hobbit. So I might revive this for a one-of here or there if something really awesome comes out. Well, no, The the Hobbit comes out in December. December, sorry. December December 18th to be exact. Well, I plan on breaking into the movie studios and stealing it so we can do it in November and make everyone else look stupid. Hang on. My cousin wants to know when the next Magic Mike movie comes out. Let's hold – can we please stop the podcast? I have to look up when the Magic Mike uh, sequel comes out because Kimberly Louise has to know when she gets to see Channing Tatum's huge cock on screen. <laughs> Pardon me, everybody. Magic Mike 2. 2015, keep your pants on. If only Channing sorry, Tatum I... would. <laughs> yes, if only Channing Tatum would. Back to you, sir. Eh. He's not going anywhere. He's got a few good years in his career, then he's going to fade into obscurity like everyone else who follows that trajectory. All right. <laughs> Expendables 3. We're going to get to this. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, the latest in the franchise that started a couple of years back when Sylvester Stallone read a script and decided we're just going to get all of the big action stars from the 90s together, 80s and 90s, and we're going to put on a throwback action movie full of profanity, blood, guts, and explosions, and it's going to be awesome. And it was. And he got as many people as he could to be in it. Some people didn't want to be in it, and then they made a second one, and they got some people who should have been in the first one, but only came around for the second. Now we've got three. And uh, I'll go ahead and give you a brief uh, rundown of what goes on in this movie. We open with the Expendables. Now, still minus Yin Yang, who has not shown up after he jumped out of an airplane in Expendables 2. They're breaking Wesley Snipes out of a prison train. Wesley Snipes is a little crazy. 
I imagine they just put him on set and said, be Wesley Snipes. They use him as the fifth man in their in their uh, latest caper. They're trying to steal some missiles from who turns out to be a founding member of the Expendables, played by Mel Gibson. Things go wrong. Terry Crews gets shot a couple of times. Sadly, does not die. Uh, Sylvester Stallone's character of Barney Ross is confronted with the mortality of everyone around him. He fires his crew, hires a bunch of young people with no appreciable skills as far as acting goes or screen presence. They try to capture Mel Gibson. It is true. No, no, Ronda Rousey did just fine. Uh, She was acceptable. That's as far as I'm willing to go. They okay. sort of successfully capture Mel Gibson. He's broken out by his army. He's like a billionaire arms smuggler. He captures the kids. Barney, Sylvester Stallone escapes, recruits Antonio Banderas, and his other group comes back to save him because despite being kicked to the curb unceremoniously, they feel some sense of loyalty. We get the big gratuitous action sequence at the end of all this. Uh, Mel Gibson dies. They all ride off into the sunset and get drunk at a bar. Now... Notable casting alterations. Bruce Willis does not return for three. His role is taken over by Harrison Ford. Eh, I can't say it's a purely lateral movement, but Harrison Ford's pretty good, so I'm okay with that. Uh, I don't know. I was just kind of left with this was just another... This didn't feel special. It didn't feel like an awesome action movie. It was just kind of there for me. So, Mark, how about you? How does this whole thing play out for you? Well, look, and I was going to throw this in as you were going through sort of the history of this. The Expendables isn't so much a movie as it is a gimmick. You know, it's supposed to be a nostalgic trip through the action movies of the action genre of the 80s and 90s. And, you know, here's the problem. I, I was thinking about this as I was reading some of the reviews and checking out some of the comments on 411. And, and that is... I don't really think we see a lot of action movies today. Most of our action type movies are wrapped up in uh, comic book movies or repurposed other properties like Star Trek. You know, Star Trek was once upon a time a sci-fi series. It's now an action movie set in space. Things of that nature. So I don't know. You know so when um, so Stallone says we're going to do an Expendables movie, it's kind of like going to see a tribute band. You know, Jed Zeppelin, that sort of thing. It's a bunch of guys from town playing the songs you all love of a band you used to listen to 20 years ago. And the problem with that is, after a while, the novelty wears off. And I think that's my best way to... I mean, independently, it was a fine movie. But if you took out the gimmick, and it wasn't you know, the action heroes of yesteryear. I'm not entirely sure how interested I would have been to see this movie. In other words, you know, you know, we were talking about what movies we were going to review for the summer blockbuster series. I said, well, we got to review the Expendables. Now, call it ham sandwich and put in Channing Tatum and his huge cock, right? I'm not going to see this movie. I don't care enough. I have not seen anything featuring Channing Tatum intentionally in well over five years. Yeah, like I, you, you know, people will notice we did not review the new 21 Jump Street movie. I didn't see it. I didn't see the first one. I don't like Jonah yeah, Hill. I, I don't like Channing Tatum. I don't like stupid comedy. And that seems like a lot of stupid comedy. Yeah, exactly. It's why we didn't do it. But you know, my, my point is, I mean, um, some, some action movies that I can think of off the top of my head that have been fairly recent – Looper, Jumper, Thumper, Frumper, I mean, whatever. You know, just movies ending in ER. And, and who do they have in them? Um, they have uh, Anakin Skywalker from the fucking Star Wars movies. Who cares? You know, they have... <laughs> so that, that's my point. I, um, the Expendables, in terms of uh, an installation in the series, was just okay. I think one of the major problems with this movie was that they wanted to do this whole uh, old versus young theme, which would have worked okay if they had found three other people like Ronda Rousey 
They tried with Victor Ortiz, and Victor Ortiz didn't have a character or anything to do in the movie. They sort of he introduced him. Does not know how to and, fire it. He doesn't know how to shoot a <laughs> shotgun. He doesn't know how to hold a shotgun. No. I watched him saw, going through with that, going, "You look as unrealistic as a toddler." And then the other two guys, I had no idea who they were or why they were in this movie. So, you know, if you're going to – if the if the entire cast of The Expendables is supposed to be a wink and a nod, like, let me, let me go back. Why, I mean, why I singled out Rousey as the only decent choice of the new generation of Expendables. When he first put the, the, the cast together, it was supposed to be the action heroes of yesteryear, right, along with genuine ass kickers. So that's why Steve Austin, not an action hero, but an ass kicker in his own right, was in the movie. Randy Couture, not an action hero, but an ass kicker in his own right. Okay, so action heroes of yesteryear and ass kickers. Ronda Rousey certainly fits the bill of ass kicker. Victor Ortiz, not so much, even though he's a professional boxer. I mean, you're really stretching it with him. And then the other two don't fit the description at all. So already your movie is off to sort of a... Yeah, already the you movie a guy was kind of a rock star. Resemble, You have a guy who vaguely resembles Chris Evans and some dude whose last name is Lutz. <laughs> yeah, I I just sat there wondering, like, I don't understand why you're in this movie. It was all I kept coming back to. And then I watched them, you know, I, I wish they had actually used, if they were going to have a guy be the computer nerd, I'd wish they'd, I wish they had found a better representation of that as a wink and a nod to the audience. Um, and then the motorcycle guy, again, find me somebody who's actually like real life into motorcycles. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I just felt like the, the young cast was very weak. Oh, horrible. And you spend a good half it's of the horrible. movie with them. Not only are they weak, they're juxtaposed with people that in some cases we've grown up watching and who will swallow up a screen if not, you know, if everything is not done properly. And, most of these people have no idea how to present themselves on screen. They're written poorly. So when any of them are standing next to Jason, St- that scene wherein Dolph Lundgren, Jason Statham, Randy Couture, and Wesley Snipes stand up to the new guys, I'm sorry, those guys look like little, they look like small children whose any semblance of presence is swallowed up by the off, by the you know the acumen and the on-screen awesomeness of those other characters. And you just can't help but feel like, Barney, you're making a huge mistake. These people bring nothing, and you've got, you know, the old war horses who will still kick all kinds of ass for you. What are you doing? You know, it's funny. I look at them, and I think to myself, okay, you have Jet Li and Jason Statham. Those are your martial arts guys in this movie. Who is your 21st century martial arts action hero? Name him. Who? Who would be your young, hip, 21st century martial arts action hero. Can't think of anybody, no can idea. you? Not yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, maybe and Tony Jaw, if he's available, and, but that's it. And, you know, I mean, look, look at some of the people that we are, you know, that, that we have today. Here's, a, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Look at the people playing the new, the, the new Fantastic Four. I'd rather what not. Was the reason, <laughs> what was the reason everyone freaked out about the casting of the new candidate? They, they, they look like children. They don't look at all imposing. They don't look like heroes. I mean, you know, Chris Evans managed to pull off Captain America, and he's about the only one I can think of. Maybe him and Chris Hemsworth are about the only two guys I can think of that really look like new, modern action heroes. And they're both I don't know, would you consider event. Vin Diesel new? Or is he no, just far Vin too Di- pigeonholed? Or has he just been around well, for no. too long? Isn't Vin Diesel like 90 years old at this point? I don't know. I'm just asking if he would qualify. I'm trying to figure out your criteria. I'm just, if I'm he's been around too long, if, fair play. He was in Guardians of the Galaxy. His only line was, I am old. I mean, that's it. That's all Vin Diesel said. <laughs> so my my point here is, so that we can move on with this, is the Expendables was a was a good idea executed poorly based on the fact they don't have good choices for modern ass kickers or modern action heroes. The only one that was even honestly what he should have done, and 
Um, and somebody pointed this out online. We should have gone with an all-girl cast. It should have been like Ronda Rousey, Gina Carano, um, Layla Ali. You know? <laughs> I and don't think Sylvester Stallone would want Layla Ali on set because he would then no longer have the deepest voice. It may be not. But, you know, something along the line. Like, there should have been another way to make it, another way to re- refine the gimmick uh, to make for a fresh movie. But those criticisms aside, it was an okay action movie. It wasn't great. It wasn't terrible. It was just there. And the only reason why it even stands out in my mind is because it's The Expendables 3. Yeah, that's kind of where I landed on it. Now, I want to ask you that what was your favorite, not favorite part, who stood out for you in this movie? Now, one of my problems with this movie, and I realized that someone warned me about it beforehand, and I realized it even more so after the fact, we have far too many people who need to be given screen time. You, you, just, you, you get like star glut. There's just too many people who need too much screen time. No one necessarily has a chance to stand out and be memorable. I have one. Well, there. Are, I mean, there are three. The three of the new guys do just fine. I've got one kind of shining star as far as things that I feel positively about this movie, and I want to know what yours would be. If you have one guy in this movie who you want to point to and say they did a good job. Okay, well, the problem here is that there were two different movies going on. So I can't give you one person because I have to to give you one per movie. Okay. Um, The the first quarter, first half of the movie, uh, my my favorite person was Wesley Snipes. He had the best lines. He had the most interesting um, action going on. I enjoyed seeing him again. Uh, When they ask him, what were you in for? And he says, tax evasion. I laughed hysterically. You know, if people got the joke, I don't know. Um, for people who don't I know, he actually, he actually did go to prison for tax evasion for a little bit. Um, so that was so that was fun. Uh, I liked Wesley Snipes in the beginning of the movie. Uh, as I said before, I liked Ronda Rousey, though I got the feeling with the way excuse me, some of the lines were delivered that when she initially shot her parts, her voice didn't carry very well, and she had to go back in post production and re-record her lines. <laughs> there were there were just what times like I me. felt like th- th- there were times where I felt like her dialogue didn't necessarily match the body that it was supposedly coming out from. But um, I thought Ronda Rousey did a good job. I thought Ronda Rousey of the three uh, new Expendables had the most a- had the most screen time and was the most interesting person. Again. The counter to that, the exact, exact opposite, Victor Ortiz, if with and a his gun black to my hole head, of charisma, I was gonna say with a gun to my head, could not tell you what his character was. He was guy. I with could tell gun. you because I saw it like a few hours ago. That's the only reason I could tell you. <laughs> really, you could tell me what his motivations were, what his characters were, what his. Oh no, I can tell was. you like brief background. That's it. Okay, you know, like. They showed him boxing, and that gave me a giggle because he's the professional boxer when he isn't whining about being hit in the face. He's the only, bo- he's the only boxer who goes with the Brock Lesnar thing of, oh, my God, don't hit me. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, Victor Ortiz sucks. Um, but, yeah, I liked Ronda Rousey. I liked her interactions with Stallone and the rest of the team. Um, actually, the person who carries this entire movie for me and – who probably had the best character of all was Mel Gibson. Darn right. This was this was a triumphant tour de force for Mel Gibson. I haven't seen him in anything this good since he was in the Lethal Weapon series. He was awesome in this. He actually reminded me of Philip Seymour Hoffman from Mission Impossible. You know, when they yeah. when they when they capture him and he's and he's just like, all right, this is ridiculous. What's your name? Because you're dead. <laughs> Like, you know, just so inconvenient as he's being captured. That's how Mel Gibson came across in this. He, you know, he came across as uh, as a great Philip Seymour Hoffman type villain. And uh, I thought it was excellent. I, Mel Gibson made this movie for me. I thought he was a much better, much more menacing and interesting villain than uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme was in the second one. One that people liked, you know, so much more than this movie. 
I would I would put uh, Gibson's performance and his character above Van Damme's from two. I still enjoyed Van Damme in two. I enjoyed Eric Roberts in one. I mean, these movies have never had a weak villain. We've just got one here it, that I mean, the scene in the back of that van when Mel Gibson is talking uh, essentially at Sylvester Stallone and everyone else, and they're kind of you know reminiscence clash of ideology and whatnot. That's the highlight of the entire movie for me. Ironic in an action-based movie that the highlight is these two guys talking. But Mel Gibson another, is another guy who can just swallow up a screen. And not in a bad way. You know, he's not chewing scenery. Everything is just, He just eclipses everything else going on right then. I mean, Victor Ortiz tries to intimidate him, and his response is, how about I open up your meat shirt and, sh- and show you your heart? And the way he says it and the way he looks at him, you know he's dead serious. If he was untied, he would actually cut out the guy's heart. You actually don't have to cut it out. You can just remove the connective tissue and kind of elevate it out of the chest cavity. It's tricky, but it can be done. Well, the editing in that scene was great because what he really said, if you if you see some of the uh, uh, some of the unedited scenes where, you know, uh, let me open up your meat shirt and show you your heart, you dirty Jew. And, and and they did a great job. Of... <laughs> it's funny because he's crazy and a little racist. <laughs> I don't care. I love Mel Gibson. Yeah, hey, I do um, too. No, he was he was definitely the highlight of the movie for me. Um, I think though the one problem I had was his final fight with Sylvester Stallone. Oh, he got so shortchanged on that. Yeah, I, I just the thing of it was is you have a situation where. All of the expendables are like, you know, teaming up and running around uh, this building as tanks are being fired at them. And it's so over the top and so great and so visually stunning. And, and all that's left is a fist fight. You, you've got a very short fist fight. And as short as it was, I, it still wasn't short enough for me. I was like, oh, my God, get this over with. I was much more interested in seeing Barney try to run off the top, uh, uh, Stallone try to run off the roof as it's collapsing beneath him, a la the dark night rises in the football stadium. You know, I, I thought that that was much more interesting than his final fight scene, his boss fight scene with Mel Gibson. I was just like, eh, who cares? I just, now, you I and just I are thought, on, the, we're on opposite sides here. I wanted more of that fight between them. Uh, I was, I think, I think at that point I was just exhausted. I just, just wanted the movie to end. And then that bar scene that seems to go on for 20 minutes, and accomplishes nothing, mind you. No. I have no idea why they feel the need to have what feels like the entire third act of the movie in that bar. It's like, can't, just, just have Jason Statham and, you know, say something. By the way, Jason Statham reduced the rot to, to Stallone's nagging wife in this movie. What happened to uh, I don't know. That aggravated me to no end. First of all, I am one of the biggest Jason Statham fans you'll find. And someone, I forget where I heard this comparison, but this is, I discovered that my like of Jason Statham and his presence and his quiet charisma is the same kind of thing that makes me a fan of Cesaro for professional wrestling fans out there. He's got the same thing going. Uh, impressive presence, impressive physicals, not the loudest guy, but certainly has kind of this quiet charisma and you're compelled to watch him. And... Again, with, and here we have just like nothing to do with very little is done with Jason Statham, and it's a, it's a crying shame. It really is because Statham is so awesome. And look, I'm okay. You want to shave screen time from Dolph Lundgren? Okay. I get you. Dolph Lundgren's there to be a presence. If he is on there a little less, I'm okay. You want to shave time with Randy Couture? I'm fine and dandy with that. And you want to? They sh- I, I maintain they should have killed Terry Crews because he serves no valuable purpose. Yeah, I and don't I, understand why they needed to keep him alive. It, it just seems so excessive. Like, no, no, we have to have the big reunion at the end with everybody and have to end happily. Like, no, he got shot twice. One through the leg. <laughs> There's a couple of major blood vessels where he was shot. The other one through the chest. Look at where they're having to apply pressure. Yeah, apparently Mel Gibson sucked as a shot. The orders around there. Your heart's around there. 
He fired at you with a high-powered rifle. I'm sorry, man. You're dead. I don't care right. what and kind of voodoo Wesley Snipes has. And the, well, and the hilarious thing about that was he, you know, in the middle of this mission, and you know, and one fuck who knows where, he's nearly shot to death, and they couldn't have gotten him appropriate medical attention fast enough for him not to die. He should have been dog meat. And yet, miraculously, not only are these people, you know, the baddest, the baddest soldiers on Earth, but they're all apparently fucking, you know, bones from Star Trek. They, they, you know, either that or the Expendables have a mutant healing factor, because there's no way he should have been alive. No way at all. I mean, it was even closer to center. He probably would have nicked the spine. There's just no way he's not dead. From a storyline perspective, I felt like, you know, look, a lot of people were complaining that, uh, you know, the movie suffers from the fact that it's not rated R, um, it wasn't bloody enough, there wasn't enough nudity, or there was no nudity, um, you know, this, that, and the other thing. I maintain you don't need to go insane with that stuff. No. However, if you wanted to give the movie uh, some much-needed depth, some much-needed gravity, kill Terry Crews. He offers well, nothing. The only thing I, I know where he lives, so I can go do that now if it'll make the movie retroactively better. No, there's no need to kill the actor. <laughs> I mean the character. The only thing I, I the only thing that he, I to me that he ever like stands out in my head for him was he was the cheeseburger guy from The Longest Yard. I haven't seen the remake because I don't oh, like you Adam haven't? Sandler. Okay, put this on. Put this on pause and go watch the Longest Yard. It's actually really good, and the the stuff with Goldberg and Steve Austin and Kevin Nash is gold. Eh, no. You see, there's Adam Sandler and there's Chris Rock, and I actively avoid both of them. I understand their movies are terrible, and I would be the last person to disagree with you about that. However, this is this is probably Adam Sandler's best movie. Cromwell's in that. All right, I might have to rethink. Yes, he plays the Dirty Warden. Uh, all right. I can never look at James Cromwell and not think that'll do, pig. <laughs> I'm telling you. The, the lo- hey, Melissa, wasn't The Longest Yard to Adam Sandler's best movie? Who the fuck? <laughs> hey, Melissa. I said, hey, Melissa. I said, now, now uh, uh, you understand that Melissa and Kimberly are not the same word? All right. right. I go to I go I go. Oh, hey I... Melissa, Kimberly pipes up. Hey Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Sandler's best movie, The Longest Yard, right? Okay. Well, she has terrible taste in movies. But hey, Kimberly, oh. it's one of the best movies. Did she isn't say it? The Longest Yard? Or did, I'm sorry. Did she say like Little Nicky? Melissa, what do you think Adam Sandler's best movie is? Her favorite is Billy Madison. Eh. Yeah, you'll have to forgive her. She doesn't really understand. Anyway, um, Comedy. go on. A- anyway. Well, I'm curious. I want to come back to something that, well, you and I are not the only people who have noticed that the younger generation is just a monumental weakness as far as this whole movie goes. So I'm curious. Should we not then fire Kelsey Grammer? Because he's the one okay. who introduced them all to this movie. <laughs> See, I I don't understand your problem with Kelsey Grammer. I don't. Um, no, no, no. I meant no, no. I meant like within the context of this movie, he introduces the single weakest link in the history of action films. Shouldn't I, he be held accountable? No, I, stop I, that. No. As far as Kelsey Grammer goes, I like him. I liked his performance. I like I mean, his joke about having lung cancer, and he gets Sylvester Stallone going with him for a minute or two. His job is kind of like finding young, you know, untapped talent for mercenary groups. I'm, I was fine with it. He was a, a minor role and one that, objectively speaking, probably could have been written out. But he made the most of his time on screen, and I'm perfectly happy with that. I like Kelsey Grammer. Yeah, I enjoyed his performance. Um, you know, you asked me who my favorites were, and you know, and they were in no particular order: uh, Wesley Snipes, Ronda Rousey, and Mel Gibson. But you know, if you were, but that's not to say that I didn't enjoy the Kelsey Grammer scenes. I think the problem was 
there was a lot of time spent on introducing very uninteresting characters. So yeah. that ho- so that whole sequence with Kelsey Grammer was great because Kelsey Grammer is a great actor and he was a great presence on screen. And then you never saw him again. And it's like, oh, well, that was pointless. Um, that was there. Yeah, I wish they had done more with him. You know, I wish he he somehow turned up later on in the movie, like you know, like so, you know, like when the because the, because the last half of the movie is so much of it is spent with Antonio Banderas. Um, <laughs> I got such a <laughs> kick out of him. And I wish they, you know, I wish when he came back licking his wounds and you know he's striking up this partnership with Antonio Banderas, that was an opportunity to kind of call. You know, or get get a phone call from Kelsey Grammer and be like, "What did you do with the with these new guys?" And you know, and, and all and not, he didn't actually have to say something like, "You have to go get them," because he was already going to go get them. But you know, maybe come back and say, "Like, I lost your team. What do what, you know? What what do I do? And what can what can you do to help me?" And you know, and something along those lines. And maybe that that might have made for an introduction of one more hero that you know we hadn't counted on. You know. One, you know, kind of a Chuck Norris kind of a character from the second movie, you know, where <laughs> where he just kind of walks out and murderizes everybody. I think I think that that would have been fun. Would have been like, look, I, you know, like I, you got you're going to go back in there and get those guys. It's a suicide mission. I have a guy that's in the area now. Meet up with him, you know. And it, it turns out to be I don't know, um, Steven Seagal. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it would be great if it were like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> old, <laughs> old Man Eastwood. Hey, Old Man Eastwood is still more intimidating than any one of those young kids that they got in this movie. Indeed. Let that let that reality sink into your brain for a minute or two there, everybody. Um, yeah, I just uh I, I felt there was too much Kelsey Grammer at once and not enough Kelsey Grammer spread throughout the rest of the film. So that was it. Similar to the complaint uh, for uh, Transformers 4, wherein we felt, hey, there's this huge section of movie that needs more Kelsey Grammer. Right. He was. They concentrate him in this one area, and then you never see him again. It's like, bum, 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 bum. you know, what, what happened to the rest of him? Do you realize that as I went on this whole rant about, you know, we don't have young action heroes, we do, they just all suck? Think about it. That's, Shia LaBeouf. That, Shia he's LaBeouf not an was action in, hero. Yeah, no, yes, he is. The Transformers no. movies were action movies, by and large. He was not the action hero within those movies. Yes, he was. I think if he's going to kind of rehab his status as an action star, the upcoming movie Fury is going to be his chance to do it. He was also Mutt in Indiana Jones. We're not talking about that. That's why he's not in this movie. <laughs> do, we want to, do we really want to put him and Harrison Ford in the same movie again? We that all know what happened hilarious. last time. I'm just thinking if they had acknowledged it, it would have been hilarious. <laughs> yes, it would have. See, they should have gotten rid of the kid who played the computer nerd. They should have had – that character should have been Shia LaBeouf. And Harrison Ford should have verbally owned him for a good, like, three-minute stretch. He really should have. It would have been hilarious. He should have called him a mutt. <laughs> Among Get other off things. my helicopter, you mutt. <laughs> All right, what else you got for me? All right. Um, delving into kind of the financials of this, this movie did not do well. It opened at what, four? Let's see. I cannot okay, find I, the list. I will, I will look for it, but can you – we didn't review Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 because as much as I'm twisting your arm and making you do things you don't want to do – I refuse to go see it, but you did see that. So take five right. minutes and explain to me. I thought you saw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Nope, won't do it. Oh, I have pleasant memories associated with that franchise. I refuse to allow Michael Bay and whoever else is associated with that movie to taint them in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Because hey, we need Will Arnett on screen. No, piss off. Oh my God, this movie lost money. The budget well, it's only was been met- out for a. It's only been out for a weekend. I mean, don't get me wrong; it's not looking good. But I forget. I just couldn't. I, it opened at like three or four. It's not looking good. Yeah, it. Um, the budget was ninety million. It's currently at forty million. 
Yeah, not... Well, it's got internationals and whatnot that might be able to help it out, but by and large, uh, no. This is not exactly uh, going to be a money-making opportunity here. And this is an odd case in that the first one seems to have been financially the most successful. And two, despite... I think I prefer two in a lot of ways to one, as far as the Expendables go, but it doesn't... It didn't make as much money. Now we've got this one... In, Incidentally, two could have been made so much better by casting the proper Hemsworth. But no, you decided Liam was the correct Hemsworth. Bunch of idiots. <laughs> Bunch of morons. I'm just throwing that out there. But so, what, what would you attribute this to? Is this maybe a little bit of franchise fatigue setting in here? Because this is the third in three years, I believe. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, again, I think the gimmick has run dry. Um, I think, you know, the first one or two times you see the action heroes of the 80s and 90s come together for a super film, there's a novelty there that's fun and exciting. And, you know, and we live in such a pussified uh, culture yeah. where uh, people clamor to the theater to see Channing Tatum take off his pants. Um, <laughs> my family hates it now when I do podcasts in the dining room instead of back in the office where I belong. Um, anywho. <laughs> now they have to hear your mockery of them on a constant basis? Yes, now they have to hear my mockery of them on a constant basis. <laughs> in any case, um, now I, you know, I think, uh, I think the novelty has worn off. I think... There's nothing. There was nothing new about the Expendables three, and what and what little bit was new wasn't interesting enough. You know, we've already talked about how they could have freshened up the new team um, and made it interesting. But I've also seen like a lot of posters for, uh, you know, and these were just, these were fan done, but like you know, Expendables Ladies Night, and it's all like Sigourney Weaver and you know all these female uh, action films. You know, what what if they had had uh, Angelina Jolie? You know who was in the Tomb Raider movies and uh, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith and whatnot. There was a, there was a place to go. See see, th- I talk about this with uh, with uh, fans of professional wrestling. You know you have to find ways to freshen up the gimmick. This wasn't freshened up enough to make it interesting for people to come out and go see it. Also, its placement on the schedule didn't help. I'm telling you, as somebody who lives and breathes the summer blockbuster season. I was getting tired of, uh, you know, I was getting burned down on summer blockbusters. I have been monstered and destructioned out, and I kind of went to go see this because I was interested, but even by the end of it, I was like, thank God the summer's over. (laughs) So had you been in charge of releasing this, would you have placed it near the start of the the summer season? Yeah, um, I think I would have put this in May. You know, I would have, I mean, just, just to go back, the, uh, May was the amazing Spider-Man and well, I would have put it. Oh, uh, we could have easily countered. Look, the amazing Spider-Man was, I assume fine. I haven't seen it because I have no interest in seeing it. And Andrew Garfield is not interesting. Jamie Foxx actively disinterests me. And I've never been a huge Spider-Man fan. Consequently, they will not be getting my money. They got plenty of other people's money. They're not hurting. But you could have easily put this out there kind of alongside that movie, and you don't have a counterpoint. On the one hand, you have all of the stuff that goes along with The Amazing Spider-Man, or we can see testosterone-filled actual men being men instead of Andrew Garfield being a puss. Okay. Um, I don't think this is right, because I thought The Amazing Spider-Man was, was May. But it's it's saying here April. It's not right. Yeah, this this calendar is all screwed up. The internet um, has failed us. It has. Okay. Uh, up, 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 uh, I need a calendar of summer releases. Damn it. I assume IMDb would help you out there. You'd think that, wouldn't you? Okay. Yeah, but I think logically. We live in a world where that's frowned upon. 
I'm going to do one more clickety click here, and then I'm, I give up. Um, okay. So, where are dates? Dates, dates, dates. This is not what I was looking for either. Um, release dates. Ah, that found it. Everyone, calm down. Um, okay. This is great radio. Um, oh, well, I, I could. This. Okay. I, um, I don't remember about things while you look it up. No, 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 no. Um, I think the Expendables could have fit nicely in May. There was nothing else in May that I recall. There was the Amazing Spider-Man. I mean, just to think about this in terms of movies we reviewed, right? We did. The, we started. We we skipped the Winter Soldier because I, you know, it was right at the beginning of the Jonas Exodus, and the movie was great, and I didn't think to review it. The whole reason we started this partially was. Um, I love The Amazing Spider-Man. Pat hated it, and I wanted to yell and scream at Pat about it. So, Which you did. Came up with, and you can, anyone else can now listen to. At the, on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network. But if you'll remember, um, there was The Amazing Spider-Man, and then we took a break pretty much until X-Men came out. I think maybe in between there, there was something else that we, that we looked at. But the, my, the point Didn't of all of this... did we do Maleficent that we, between those two? Yeah, okay. So uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about release schedules, there is no reason why you couldn't have shoved the Expendables somewhere in between the Amazing Spider-Man and Maleficent. As a matter of well, fact, you could have had Godzilla come out, out and, around then, too? Uh, maybe? Because we didn't review Godzilla, but I believe Godzilla was April. Um, was it May? It might have been first week of May. I, I I wish the Wikipedia page didn't lie to me. I'm gonna try this one more time because now I'm really curious. 2014 movie. You're release. actually better off. I I would imagine you're better off actually like finding the specific movie instead of going by their general page, which has not been updated. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I got it now. <laughs> I think we're good here. All right. Um, this is going slow. That'll happen. All right, let me, while you look, let me get a brief complaint I have out of the way. To whoever directed this, and I saw your name, I immediately dismissed it as completely irrelevant. <laughs> Learn how to properly shoot a fist fight. You did a perfectly fine job shooting the action sequences. The it, the gunplay scenes were all fine. I'll forgive the ludicrousness of Kellen Lutz driving around on a dirt bike. I will not forgive you for screwing up the basic premise of dumping a grenade down the barrel of a tank. Now, why, you might ask... Am I going to be so aggravated with your inability to adequately portray the results on screen? Two reasons. One, I know for a fact you do not get a, a uh, bit of flame that shoots up from under the tank as though you just lit the gasoline that was there for the special effect. I know that's not how it works. I have a brain. I can think about these things. And two, in the season finale, or the mid-season finale of The Walking Dead... Daryl throws a grenade down the barrel of a tank, and you get the actual result of what happens. Here it is, free TV. And you, director, sir, should have looked at that and said, well, we will do this. No. Instead, we will do something that looks ridiculous and would in no way affect the actual functionality of this heavily armored vehicle. Okay. Dumbass. Just to, so I can get this over with. May 2nd. Um, the Amazing Spider-Man 2, Walk of Shame, Bell, The M-Word, The Bachelor Weekend, Bad Johnson, Beneath the Harvest Guide, Blood Glacier, Clutter, Decoding Ann Parker, Farmland for a Woman, Friended to Death. Well, into limited releases that no one cares about. <laughs> okay. So the only one that no one, the only one that anyone would have given a shit about uh, for May 2nd was The Amazing Spider-Man. But you don't want to go head-to-head with that. So what was the next weekend? 
Um, uh, May 9th was Neighbors, which was your comedy with uh, Seth Rogen. Um, Mom's Night Out, Legends of Oz, uh, some sort of live action Tarzan, Chef. Okay, see, this is when I would have put it out then. Yeah, nothing. (laughs) May 9th was when I would have put it. Well, wow, it took forever to get here. Uh, May 9th is when I would have uh, put the Expendables out, not August. All right. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right to me. I to, you by don't way, want to, to, put... to, an- to answer your question, Godzilla came out May 16th. Okay. Now, here's my, my other complaint, apart from poorly executed stuff involving tanks. Really, do you not, have you, do you not know how to properly execute a tank destruction on film, my friend, because you looked miserable at it. My other thing, if you have guys engaged in hand-to-hand combat, jump cuts and shaky cam are the bane of every filmgoer's existence. Don't do it! There's my, there's my you, major gripe about that. Alright, well, did you find the action hard to follow at times? Or, um... No! Was it just, okay. you just didn't like, you didn't like the style? I did not like the style. Of, no, I don't like shaky cam by and large. I certainly don't like fast jump cuts in a fist fight. Now, I know why they do it. Do you want to know why they do it, everybody? Because between the stuntmen and the actors, they can't actually portray anything approaching legitimate physical violence. To mask this and their bad stage fighting, we get jump cuts and shaky cam. And my dogs agree with me. Hang on. Hey! <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, you were more menacing in that uh, last few seconds than Victor Ortiz was in the whole movie. It's not hard to be more menacing than Victor Ortiz. I'll just go ahead and throw that out there. But yes. <laughs> if, you're, if you have to make up your lack of ability to properly execute a fight on st- on film with shaky cam and a bunch of jump cuts, you have failed deeply as a fight choreographer or a director. Or both. Example. Go ahead and I'll throw out the biggest one, the most aggravating one probably, Ronda Rousey bouncing in New York City. Never mind the fact that you don't bounce in heels. It's a poor decision. <laughs> it's no, no, no. Now, now, wait. No, no, no. I'm going to argue with you there. The whole point of that was to set up her badassery. She, yes, I understand she was the bouncer, not the hostess. It was a gag, Robert. It was a gag to show that she was, was a, a sexy badass. It was a gag that bothered me a little bit, but the point is, the scene wherein she takes out four guys on the dance floor looks horrible. You can't tell what's yeah, going really on. Does. You have no idea You're, what it was she did. The fight, her, her fight scenes at the end are a little bit better. But that whole nightclub scene, I was like, it was just kind of crunch, 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 wide angle shot. Everyone's dead. Oh, okay. With, yeah, we, with Monica Rousey, you want to see her twisting arms off people. It's not difficult to do this properly, but if you're lazy or incompetent, you get you're introducing a major character. You could, you should be able to just clearly and concisely convey in a visual fashion that she's a badass. Instead, we get dance lights, dance music, jump cuts, and jokes from Kelsey Grammer and Sylvester Stallone interspersed with this. Now, the jokes from Grammer and Stallone are kind of par for the course. That's the tone of the movie. Combined with the rest of it, it's aggravating. Almost as aggravating as Antonio Banderas trying to one-arm fire an AK-47. Doesn't work, people. Doesn't work. You can't fire it like that. The gun. Uh, can I can I suggest that you need to start a third podcast? Third podcast called This Week in Guns. Why? Because you, there's you plenty of those out there. So, you sound so passionate about it. I, I just want to see you railing about guns in some way. It bothers me when it's done improperly. Plenty of. Plenty of people do it correctly. Look, Sylvester Stallone, Dolph Lundgren, Jason Statham. I'd go so far as to include uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
and Jet Li. They know how to handle the weapons they're given. They carry them in a realistic fashion, or realistic enough for film. They fire them in a realistic fashion. I'll give you, uh, I'll have to, you forgive Schwarzenegger because he's firing the semi-automatic shotgun from the hip, which, all right, it's large, there's a powerful kickback, and it's Schwarzenegger, he's earned the right to do a few stupid things. But gently, properly shoulders the H&K 9mm MP5. Statham properly holds the M16 variant he has. Stallone knows how to properly fire a weapon. Dolph Lundgren knows how to properly fire a weapon. And then we have Antonio Banderas doing the Chuck Liddell victory pose while holding an AK-47 firing it and apparently killing six or seven people. I am okay. That I will strain my credulity for things like Schwarzenegger firing accurately from the hip. Unrealistic, but okay, I'll go with you. Jet Li being able to fire the helicopter-mounted M60 accurately with little recoil. Okay. Well, again, stretch. Stallone firing accurately with a wheel gun after a quick draw. Okay, we're pushing it. That's about as far as I'm willing to go. Antonio Banderas, freeform breakdancing or parkour, trying to then fire an AK-47 while looking like a total buffoon. You have crossed the line. That's where I draw it. And you went over it. I will say him hitting on Ronda Rousey during their entire sequence was hilarious. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Know how to fire the damn weapon. Okay. This has been Gun Talk with uh, Robert Winfrey. <laughs> uh, the uh, the National Rifle Association is just a proud partner <laughs> of the Rifle Broadcasting Network. I'm not even a member of the NRA. I probably should be. You should be the goddamn spokesperson. Jesus Christ. I- Eh, I don't want the F. I don't want to go through the effort. And I'm just aware of how you should properly fire an automatic or semi-automatic weapon. It's not. That was not even against his body. Nothing of that weapon touched Antonio Banderas except his hand around the trigger. I'm going to start I playing defy, sound effects from my soundboard. I defy anyone to fire a gun like that in that same fashion and not have it fly out of your hand. <laughs> And I got two feet. All right, that was my other, that was my last big complaint. That one shot of Antonio Banderas doing that. You should know better, sir. You should know better. You good now? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, great. You want to take us out? Uh, sure. Why not? Uh, well, uh, now there's a couple of other quick things I wanted to ask you. Now. This movie is unlikely to be terribly profitable. Again, we mentioned opening weekend, it's not even halfway back to its budget. You have to double your budget, give or take, to really become profitable. Strong overseas markets, we could make this a profitable movie, but is this kind of the end of the Expendables for the immediate future here? Well, they're talking about me. I mean, um, rumor has it there's a fourth one. Rumor has it Hulk Hogan says he's going to be in it. Which you kind of have to take what he says with a with a grain of salt. A um, real bag of horse lick salt. Uh, but as of right now, from what I understand, there's still going to be um, there's still going to be a Expendables four. Though at this point, to, to paraphrase Chris from last night, haven't we? Got, haven't we been told all we need to know about the Expendables by this point? I mean, really, at this point, like, how many more of these movies can can we do that are going to be interesting? I feel like they did this bit with 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 the kids, and that's fine and all, but uh, I feel like they ended on a good note, a good place to end the series. I don't want to see a fourth one. First of all, I think they're out of. You know, they're out of men from the '80s. That would be interesting. So I, uh, you still got to get Mister T. Come on. Only if he's the villain, and only if he's working for his mother. (laughs) Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of over the Expendables. This was for me. uh, You know, I they do another one. I'll probably go see it anyway. But um, just because I'm a sucker like that. But I, I. But for all intents and purposes. I'm going to go ahead and do it to the intern who who is listening to this podcast that works for Sylvester Stallone. Please stop making these movies. 
to, uh, there are other franchises you can run into the ground. You've got the Rambo franchise. You could do another one of those. Um, uh, I'm fine with how they ended Rambo. Oh, with him going home. Oh no, yeah. they need to do they need to do Rambo with 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 uh, homegrown terrorists. No, they maybe, they, maybe they maybe they can. Maybe they could do a movie where where uh, some unarmed African American man attacks no, him in no. the street. He shoots. Wait, I'm sorry. Too soon. I just think it's stupid. It's so <laughs> it's completely unrealistic to expect any of that to happen. You're straining credulity here, Mark. <laughs> All right. I mean, come on. I imagine uh, the negative reaction to that being portrayed on screen would be something like, "This never happens in real life." We'd get boycotts, they'd lead to riots, they'd lead to looting, but it's not really about the looting, it's about protesting social injustice displayed in cel- in cinema. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that was essentially the discussion we had last night on the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, okay, so I, I, I think we've said all that we need to say about the Expendables story. Yeah. So, all right. Do we want to do we want to do a summer wrap up? You know, um, maybe invite some of the other guys if they want to uh, jump on here and just kind of talk about um, all of the movies that uh, you know. Go back and talk a little bit about the Winter Soldier, which is now on DVD, um, and Godzilla, which we never got a chance to talk about, and just sort of going over the whole breadth of summer movies. Um, you want to do that next week? I'm down. I think coming out okay, next week. So- Trying to think if something interesting comes out next week, and I don't believe there is, but... Well, whatever there is, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, you're, you're done. All right. Anything else that comes out between now and The Hobbit, if I do, it'll be a one-of with somebody else. So I won't ask you unless you ask me. Um, later tonight, there's a Casual Heroes recording in theory, from what I've been told, possibly. So look for that to appear on the casualheroes.net either uh, Friday or Saturday. It's usually about when they go up. Um, tomorrow night, Robert Cooper and I will be reviewing, and possibly Sean Garmer, if he uh, is able to, we'll be reviewing the new Judas Priest album, Redeemer of Souls. Yay. And uh, the Whiskey Rebellion will be back next Tuesday. Robert Winfrey and I, and maybe some others, will be back next Wednesday to discuss uh, summer movies. And then... The Long Road to Ruin looks at Batman the Animated Series Volume 2 and 3 on Thursday. Yay. <laughs> um, and in theory, depending on everyone's availability, we may or may not be doing live uh, alternate commentary for UFC 170. Is it 177? That we're up to? Nobody. 177? <laughs> UFC 170, nobody knows. So UFC 177, it's headlined by the rematch between uh, new UFC bantamweight champion TJ Dillashaw and Henan Burrell. And I'm just going to keep headline, subtitling it No Buys because nobody bought their first one. I don't imagine anybody's going to be too interested in buying their second one. You don't think so? Not especially, no. I mean, and the UFC can try and hype this fight all they want. I covered the first one. Great performance from Dillashaw. We can talk. We can. You know, they can spew over and over again. Goldberg and Joe Rogan verbally filleting T.J. Dillashaw. I don't think you're going to entice any new buyers. The only people who might be interested in this are Dillashaw's family and the diehard fans. And even then, when this had this was a much better card when you had a solid co-main event of Demetrius Johnson crushing a can. Because you had something else on the card that actually mattered. Now, not so much. My prediction. All right. You hear that Dominic Cruz got bumped to the prelims? Yeah, I saw that. But that didn't bother me because my assumption there was with uh, them putting on Eddie Alvarez on the pay-per-view portion, they figured, oh, well, people will um, people will want to go see Dominic Cruz um, yeah, it's the old trying to draw eyes to the Fox Sports. He's the main event section. of the prelims on Fox Sports That's 1. That's right. That poor guy. That's what I'm saying. I'm still not convinced he's actually getting in the cage. Till that door shuts and he's on the inside <laughs> of the cage, I don't think it'll happen. That's my position uh, with Dominic I, Cruz. I don't disagree with you. Uh, if you enjoyed that little brief bit of banter as far as the world of MMA goes... 
Every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host the 411 Ground and Pound Radio Show, your weekly dose of the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts, myself and Jeff Harris. This week, we'll be reviewing two fight nights, uh, fight nights 48 and 49, headlined by Michael Bisbing versus Kung Lee and Benson Henderson versus Rafael Dos Anjos, respectively, and previewing UFC 177, uh, Brow versus Dillashaw 2, because the bantamweight division kind of sucks and we don't know what else to do with the champion that no one cares about. And uh, my, also my own podcast every Friday, Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. I'm focusing on wrestling villains, doing it kind of an uh, anthology style. And this week, I believe, Mark, you and I, wrestling and the World Wrestling Federation, uh, sort of cartoony into the Attitude Era through roundabout WrestleMania 17. Sound about right? Sounds good to me. So we'll get to talk about Bret Hart, Vince McMahon, The Rock, half a dozen other turns here and there because Vince Russo. That's the only reason I have everybody, because Vince Russo. (laughs) So be on the lookout for that this Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Next couple of weeks after that, uh, WCW and ECW both get their time in the spotlight. Then I'll do a couple of shows moving forward, and then I'll be wrapping up Wrestling Villains. My last one is me talking about how great Bobby Heenan is for 60 minutes. I dropped the ball and that I wasn't able to get a hold of a couple of people who would have been great additions to it. That's on me. I will probably try and reschedule that, revisit it with some people who have more stories and are more knowledgeable than I am, because that's always more entertaining for everyone else. Uh, If you're a fan of, if you've been on 411 Mania and the MMA Zone, Mark Radledge is participating in Fact or Fiction. Mark, you still up on votes? Uh, Last time I checked here, let me look again. We had a live count here. here. All right, and the answer is only one comment, and it was somebody just wanting to participate in the in the actual event. Yeah, good for them. Remember when remember when Factor Fiction used to get like you know hundreds of comments? Remember when MMA used to be a thing? Uh, I'm 21 to 14 with five with five voting draw. All right, so continue voting for Mark. We have to overcome those draw votes. So show up, read, vote for whoever you think wins. Uh, I don't know when my next Factor Fiction thing is. It should be coming up relatively soon. Also on Saturday, if you don't want to watch UFC Fight Night 49, Henderson versus Dos Anjos, I have live coverage at 411 Mania. We will see if my voodoo curse has actually been broken or if Papa Shango just took a vacation for a couple of events. Because he apparently showed up for the prelims of the last card and poor Larry Zonka had to deal with it. And he showed up for the main event of Ryan Bader and OSP, to the shock of no one. I don't think that was so much a uh, a, a voodoo curse as it was Ryan Bader sucked diddly I completely uh, agree with your point. Uh, Larry <laughs> will be covering the fight night from Macau, China, headlined by Michael Bisbing and Kung Lee, and a bunch the of other... The only fight anyone will watch. Uh, I actually like the co-main event. It's Tyron Woodley and Dong Yun Kim. Okay, that's not bad either. So, no, that that's fine. Everyone else is some Chinese or Asian who I have never heard of. Like one or two of them I vaguely recall from the last, uh, from the Tough China finale. But you got a lot of local guys just kind of making their promotional debuts. So, here's hoping that results in a lot of quick finishes. We can all hope. It is hoping. Then in the, Well, then that Saturday evening, I get to do the Ben Henderson, Rafael Dos Anjos fight. I'm praying Ben Henderson has again decided he wants to finish, and he wants it quickly. Because Ben Henderson tends to get what he wants. (laughs) All right. Anything else? I think that's it. So, for Mark, I don't don't have outro music. I don't have outro music, so you have to pick something. Eh, I want something that's short. I'll go ahead and use my normal outro because it's only two seconds. <laughs> and I don't want to listen to... Again, Bridge on the River Kwai introduced that particular jingle to popular culture way back in, like, the early 50s, I think. Don't quote me on that. but And it just has never gone away. All right, so for Mark Radulich, I'm Robert Winfrey reminding you all to be well, be safe, and behave. So say goodnight to the bad guys.